I'm not sure how I ended up on the same stage with two wonderful keynote speakers, but here I am. Um, so I'm going to talk about grounding databases in Gen AI applications. Um, let's see if I get my clicker to work. I have a lot of trouble with my clicker. There it goes. Okay, a little bit about me. Uh, as Lucas said, I'm an organizer. Uh, all the organizers raise their hands. We have four, four here tonight. So we are GDG Cloud Boston. We have a fifth organizer, Joe Lusk, who's not here this evening. Um, we've been running this group for at least eight to 10 years. Lucas probably started 10 years ago. Um, I'm also a Google champion innovator. I have multiple cloud certifications and FinOps certifications. A lot of experience with mostly in database area. I uh, won't, won't say much more about, about that, but um, if you have questions, come and find me. Um, right now, I'm one of the things that we're doing at GDG Cloud Boston is that we're running certification workshops in the area of database. There are a lot of Google Cloud certifications. I think there are 11 professional, 10 or 11 certifications now. Um, a lot of these are professional level. This one is Pro Cloud Database engineer. There's another similar one called data engineer. It's different, but similar. Um, we're about halfway through a series of 12 events. Uh, is anybody, has anybody in this room joined any of our certification workshop events? Yeah. Couple, couple people. Okay, so you know what these are. Uh, we've run four series now at GDG Cloud Boston, and we're very proud to be able to bring you this content. Um, it's one of the things that I'm really interested in. We're, we're uh, getting a lot of cooperation from Google in the Road to Google Developer Certification Program. We're going to continue to run these, and if you give us good feedback, we can take that to Google and say, you should really continue this program because it's very important to help people get trained and certified on Google Cloud. Um, my interests are diverse. I have four main interests that I'm going to tell you about this evening. One is cloud training and thought leadership in that area. Uh, FinOps, which is about cloud cost optimization and running efficiently in the cloud, whatever you build. So these are enter large enterprise applications. We need to run them efficiently in order to, to um, really save money and, and be, be good stewards of the environment as well. So there's, that's FinOps and the related field of green ops. Um, I uh, have a lot of experience in databases. Data lake houses uh, is the newest kind of data warehouse, really. It's called a data lake house. I'm very interested in how to design and build those. BigQuery is an important part of that. It's not the whole story, but I'll uh, tell you a little bit about that. And finally, the topic of the, the, that relates to the title of my talk is uh, Enterprise Generative AI Applications. How do you design and build those? And uh, just one word about that. One of the things that I learned from going to talks at Google up in Cambridge, and also uh, Concheck on a lot of this this evening, there's a big difference between consumer-facing generative AI and enterprise applications. So the consumer facing are things like ChatGPT and Gemini and BART. You know these things, you've used them, right? But those are not what companies need to build in their enterprises to make the most powerful generative AI applications that they, that they need to use in large enterprises. So there's a very important dividing line there. I'm more interested in the enterprise side. How do we connect LLMs, foundation models, to databases and document stores within a company. I'm trying to go very fast because I've given a, a limited amount of time here this evening. I'm gonna to try to finish on time. Uh, you keep me on time there if you want to. Uh, so I'm gonna go through my first couple of topics very quickly and then go to the Gen AI stuff. So one of the things we do here at these IO extended events is we give a recap of some of the learnings that, we, that our organizers have gone to traveled to California twice. We went to Google Next, most of us. We went to Google I.O., we went to Google Connect. What did we learn there? That's what we're going to review. I'm gonna do like a five minute recap of what, what I personally think is most important. Um, I'm putting this all together as what I call the learning season or the season of innovation at Google. There's kind of a rolling uh, series of events that goes from Google Next to I.O. and so forth. I'm put, kind of putting it in the season, meaning the spring and summer of 24, okay? I'm not gonna try to differentiate, this happened at Next, this happened at I.O., but 
it's all putting it together. Okay, and it's, it's so exciting. I want to tell you about some really important innovations in the training field. Skills Boost is the training platform for Google Cloud, hands down. If you have access to Pluralsight or Coursera, those are wonderful, but you should be on Skills Boost as well. And the great news is Google is making so many free opportunities. Free, 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 right? You join one of our workshops, you get free access for three months to Skills Boost. All the labs you can do. And they've now announced at Google I.O. there's a program called Google Cloud Innovator. Anybody can sign up and get 35 credits per month for free. Okay, that's not a huge amount. If you're doing this, like, if your goal is, like your day job is to get certified, that's not enough, but it's enough for most people. And it's, it's quite a generous amount, actually. So 35 credits, if you join one of our programs, you get even more, unlimited. And then for some companies, for certain Google customers, Skills Boost access is totally free. So also they're having a program called Instrumentless um, Credits where it's making it a lot easier for organizers like us to have events where we can do demos. Every, we can give everybody a $5 credit just for showing up. And you don't have to have a credit card. You don't have to have a trial account. You, don't, you can just show up and we can give you a $5 credit that gets you through the day. Okay? That's, and that's part of the DevRel team at Google. They're doing a fantastic job on this. I need to move on. In the FinOps area, I'm just going to mention two things. There's something new called FinOps Hub, where you can get recommendations. You can get a, um, a score. A score, how well, are you, how well is your company doing on FinOps? This is my personal domain. Uh, I'm doing, I have a 3.2 industry average, is like 2.4 or something like that. The industry average is pretty pathetic, so overall we're not doing a great job on FinOps. We have a lot of room to improve and grow, but the only reason I'm doing well is because I hardly have any resources at all and there's not much to optimize, so I've already done a decent job of turning stuff off that I'm not using. Um, guess what? AI is coming to FinOps. So what do we have? We have Dr. Bullseye Forecaster on the right side, which is an AI-powered recommendation. Uh, they're, well, they're, they're AI-powered recommendations, and there's also the forecasting, which is now AI-enabled. This just gives you more accurate forecasting. It's one of the more difficult parts of FinOps is to do budgeting and forecasting. This really helps a lot. I, I need to move quickly. Um, in the Data Lakes and Lake House area, uh, this paper came out this within the last couple of months. Um, Big Lake is now evolving towards more, um, more and better, more powerful use of what we're calling open table formats. Mainly this is iceberg. And if you followed the news with, between Snowflake and Databricks, you know that um, Databricks bought Tabular recently, and that's had a big, that's going to have a big impact on this field of um, open, what we call open data architectures, open data lake architectures, and, uh, or it's sometimes called even a headless data architecture. So we're now splitting the storage engine and the compute engine in a data warehouse. That's never been done before. Uh, well, it's never been done at a large scale before. It's, it's becoming now a common pattern. It has been happening in some companies for a while, but it's now uh, becoming a prevalent pattern. So uh, I'm going to pivot now to generative AI. Gen AI itself and the availability of foundation models and LLMs is driving a lot of more compute and driving a lot of enterprises to the cloud. The movement was already well underway, but Gen AI really helps push even more workloads to the cloud because the training, any, if you're doing any training, that's a bursty workload, and it requires expensive GPUs, and you would not want to buy, you, first of all, if you can even get GPUs right now, they're very expensive, and why would you want to buy something, install it in your own data center, and then use it you know, only, only occasionally when you need to do tra a big training job? So it's a naturally made fit for the cloud, and... Um, Large data sets that you want to use for training are best kept in cloud data warehouse or cloud data lake. And um, Google, Google Cloud provides, as you've all been hearing all evening, a really great integrated suite of AI tools and data management tools. And it's all 
it's all pre-built. All you have to do is, is uh, move your data there and start using it. Of course, you have to pay for it, but um, it's a more effective way than doing it, trying to build all of this yourself and put all these best of breed tools together by yourself. Um, grounding is essential. Okay, I'm, I'm going as fast as I can. Uh, grounding is essential. Uh, as anybody that lives near a tall building or tower would know, you, you, better, you, better, you, better be, you better know about grounding. What does that really mean, though, in terms of what we're talking about? I went to Wikipedia and I said, oh, there's all these different meanings of grounding. In communications is the closest one. It's a collection of mutual knowledge, beliefs, and assumptions, what we call common ground. You've heard the word in machine learning when we have a, a, a train, a, a, um, a, a label set of data that we use for training, that's called ground truth, right? And the word ground itself in many languages like English and German actually means not only the ground we walk on, but it also means the reason or the grounds for doing an action, right? It has this meaning, goes back centuries in many languages. Um, the benefits of grounding in AI uh, as opposed to just, uh, if you go to submit a query to Gemini without any grounding, right? It's just, you're just gonna get an answer from Gemini. That's a standard stock response from an LLM. That, doesn't, that may have hallucinations. It is not using local knowledge. It is not up to date because it's only up to date to the training, whenever the data was trained. And it doesn't give you explainability typically of where it got those results from. And so grounding gives you all these things and this is what enterprises need as Conch gave some examples of this already. Um, how do we do grounding? And, and by the way, this word grounding is something that I heard a lot more at Google at I.O. conference, much more than I heard anywhere else and much more than I'm hearing from other vendors. So Google likes this word grounding and it really means, we used to always say RAG, everyone's talking about retrieval augmented generation or RAG, but grounding is a little more of a general idea. It can be done in two ways. We can have grounding, which is done with search engine grounding, or we can do RAG, which is still important. Um, what, what about, so RAG means we connect a foundation model to a corporate document store or maybe to a corporate database. And I'll dive into that a little bit more. This is our architecture. I don't have enough time to dwell on this and the details are not really that important. But basically, we take our document store, our database, and we run it through um, something like Langchain to create embeddings. We're, we're gonna store those embeddings as vectors in a database. That's the point I'm making, is that Underneath all of these applications, databases are everywhere. They're not much talked about. A lot of people don't think that's the interesting part of the problem, but they're essential every, at every step. So if you want to store a lot of vectors, you have to do it in a database. You may want to um, keep your data that you're using for training maybe in a database, especially if it's rapidly changing data or constantly being updated throughout the day, like could be maybe a news feed or um, could be stock prices, things that are rapidly changing. You're gonna use a database and not just a pile of PDF files somewhere. Okay, so databases are everywhere in the RAG architecture. Um, what are the innovations that I learned about at Next and IO? Okay, SCAN, which is scalable approximate nearest neighbor, is a very important algorithm that's used in, in um, calculating similarity of vector, so this is critical. As your vector database gets very large, you will need to have a more efficient algorithm than brute force. You just can't scan every, you can't just do every pairwise comparison of every vector to see what you're similar. So you need this algorithm. That algorithm's been around from 2020. What's new is it's being incorporated now into AlloyDB and almost every other database within the Google Cloud um, e ecosystem. Um, Langchain and VectorDB features are being built into virtually every Google Cloud database platform. What does that mean? That's great. It means you don't have to, when you're choosing which database to use, you should use the one that fits your use case the best. You don't have to say, oh, well, I wanna use, I wanna use AI features or VectorDB, therefore I have to use AlloyDB, that's my only choice. No, you have a choice of all across the full range of databases. You can use any one you want because those AI features are enabled almost everywhere. It's coming now, just this quarter and last quarter, this is going into um, uh, public preview and now into GA. 
Um, another big innovation was in the field of uh, the Gemini has now an improved context window, of one million tokens, and I think it's two million is two million is either GA or is coming soon into GA. So that's actually really helpful. Also on the bottom, I put context caching, very helpful as well. Um, are these, some people call this the rag killer, the really large context window as a rag killer. Is that really true? You know, can we just, with that huge context window, that's like an hour worth of video or, you know, hundreds of thousands of words, can we just stuff everything in the context window? Well, the answer is no. Um, we still need rag. Large context window. It, by the way, this is Gemini's interpretation of a rag doll. <laughs> Uh, we still need RAG because the large contact window is great. It's easy to set up. It's really useful in prototyping and uh, experimentation. But um, processing large context windows is still slow and expensive. And it doesn't provide the explainability. And it doesn't give you the audit trail. And, and the, in other words, we don't, have, we don't really know what, what data they base the decision on. We don't know um, uh, what the... What the uh, how did it arrive to that? Uh, you know, what was, tra what was the, re the reasoning trail there? We don't have an idea of freshness of the data that was used in the decision. Um, that's it.